Isaac Hernandez. And I'm Holly McClure. And this is Faith on Film, a program designed to keep you informed on everything that's happening in the world of faith and family entertainment. How are you, Holly? Doing great. And I'm very excited about today's show because we're going to be talking about a movie that's based on a true story. And yeah. it's a story that I feel is going to impact probably every person who's watching it, because what are we dealing with today? What's the, one of the big mm -hmm. topics in culture? Racism. That's one yeah. of the big topics, but also really faith in the attack on the church and on Christians. Mm -hmm. And so this story has it all and more. It's going to be exciting to talk about. Yes, it is. And the movie releases October 21st. Um, and so get out there uh, and, and see it. It's releasing nationwide and I think over 500 theaters. So that's a pretty good release for a movie. And what's the name of the movie? It is called Paul's Promise. Now, that doesn't quite tell us what the movie's all about. So we probably should That's take a right. look at a clip. Let's watch it. To find and of course, after the clip, we'll get to talk to the star of the movie and he'll tell us there all you about go. it. All right. All right. Here we go. I dreamed Paul found Jesus every day I'm praying because I believe it would come true. And you don't know that he won't. I'd like to be here to see it. All right. If you pass and Paul finds God two weeks afterwards, will that sit all right with your soul? And nobody gonna pray for that child like I do. I will. Hmm. your word. You know you have it. Good to see you, Paul. You too. You know, if you ever want to come down to the office, we could talk or pray if you'd like. Yeah, probably not. You can pray for me if you want. You can give a man upstairs a big thank you for me. What would you like me to thank him for? You can thank him for rewarding all my mama's years of faithfulness by giving her cancer. God is good all the time. Paul, I know this is hard, and I'm so sorry that this is happening. Know that God is right here with you. He's sad about this too. He grieves with you. How can you say that? You know what she's been through. Was God with us then? I know it didn't feel like it, but I guarantee you he was. More than that, he can take all of this, all of the anger and the pain and the fear, all of it, and he can make it into something new and beautiful. Yeah, we better hurry up. She ain't got long to see it. I wasn't talking about your mama, Paul. You lived that same hard life with her. Just because you didn't get the same bruises she did doesn't mean your daddy didn't leave a mark on you. Will was a broken man with a lot of demons haunting him. And he lashed out in a whole lot of horrible ways. But you can't change that. I swear if you say the word forgive, I'm not going to say forgive. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes you can focus so much on one thing that you lose sight of everything else. Your daddy stole a lot of joy from you, your mom, and your family. Don't let him steal what little time you have left. Mama? Mm. I'm done with work. My liver just quit. I didn't know a liver could just up and quit. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here last night. I should have been here. Hush. I forgive you. You know I always will. Yeah, I know, Mama. You think anymore about taking my prayer list to church? I have. <clears throat> I'll take it for you. No. You promise? I promise. Oh, let me 
makes me so happy. You gotta listen to the pastor when he gives the call. Let's just focus on one promise at a time, all right? Fair enough. Not gonna stop me from praying for it, though. Mom, God knows the kind of man you're gonna turn out to be. Just have to remind him to get started. Ryan, welcome to Faith on Film. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. No, yes, the star of the movie, Ryan yeah. O'Quinn. I mean, that was a great performance, I just want to say. I've watched this oh, several yeah. times now, and again, that was just so powerful. It's so moving. Let me give you a oh, quick introduction here. Let me give you a quick, just so people get an idea a little bit about who you are. But Ryan Quinn uh, is a film and television actor and producer, also known, also the founder and CEO of Damascus Road Productions, a Los Angeles-based film and television production company specializing in family content. You're also known, apparently, for uh, being on shows like Beverly Hills 90210, Alias, Jag, Melrose Place, and Rock, uh, uh, Third Rock from the Sun. Uh, as well as films like uh, Starship Troopers and The Thing That You Do, which was directed, of course, by Tom Hanks. Uh, you know, something else that I was able to pick up from the film, by the way, is that it also seems to deal with generational curses and the breaking of a generational curse, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you're exactly right. And and not only is that biblical, of course, but, you know, it's, it's a real thing. And so uh, in, in the case of Paul Holderfield Sr., who I play in the film, uh, he is, he's cursed. He's, you know, squarely standing on the, the shoulders of those that have come before him. And, and you could say that he was, uh, you know, he's, he, the sins of the fathers are father is a real thing. And so he's trying to right. figure out how best to overcome that. And, uh, as you see a, a theme of the, uh, of his journey throughout is not wanting to be, uh, compared to his father. Say, you know, this is based on a true story, isn't it, Ryan, which I think makes it even more compelling is that there were really a family who did this. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's based on a true story. And uh, the movie is set in 1967, Little Rock, Arkansas, in the height of the civil rights movement, of course, in the American South. And it's a true story uh, of a man named Paul Holderfield, who, by his own admission, was a, a racist, a bigot, uh, not a good guy. And uh, he had a childhood best friend who was black. And they were both sons of sharecroppers in their in their childhood, and they were uh, best buddies in every sense of the word. And then, as they got into their middle school years and their high school years, and and uh, you know, sycophant friends and others started speaking into their life. Um, it was it was uncool to be hanging out with each other. And Paul, uh, you know, was again by his own admission the worst of these, and um, he turned his back literally and figuratively on on uh, his best friend. As a matter of fact, the um, we, we tweaked it a little bit for um, for uh, artistic reasons. But the, the true story of when he reconnected with Jimmy Lipkin was uh, sir, uh, was around the Little Rock Nine incident in 1957, wow. when those nine students were um, were ushered into Central High School in Little Rock, and Paul Holderfield, who was a firefighter at the time, was there on sort of a um, uh, you know a, a safety mm -hmm. mission and trying to keep the peace. And his childhood best friend walked up to him and saw him and said assumed that he was there in support of the uh you know of the little rock nine and stuck his hand out to greet him and paul said he stuck his hands in his back pocket and pretended like he didn't know the man and that really haunted him for a number of years until uh honestly the lord got hold of his life and he did a complete 180. wow wow was any or any of the family or participants that are in the movie those characters are any still alive today there, Paul Holderfield Sr. is not alive. He passed away in 1998. His son, Paul Jr., is now the senior pastor of that church. So he stepped into his father's uh, big shoes and uh, is the pastor of that church, which has grown exponentially in the last 50 years. Um, Paul Sr.'s other two children, Paula and Philip Holderfield, are also in vocational ministry at that same church. Jimmy Lipkin passed away several years ago, but the two men were very close friends. And it's been such a unique and, and fun opportunity to get to meet the um, the descendants of the real family. So before we uh, before we started uh, filming, we got a chance to sit with the Holderfield family and talk to them. I got a chance to pour through videos and read the books and look at sermon notes uh, from Paul and really try to dive into uh, the the character of the man and understand, you know, kind of what he was about. And uh, and Joseph Cannon, who plays opposite me, who plays Jimmy Lipkin uh, in the movie, he's gotten a chance to reconnect with uh, or connect with the grandchildren of some of Jimmy's family, which is very sweet. Oh my how, did, how, did you, how did you find this story? 
Yeah, good question. The, there was a screenplay. Firstly, there was a book. Uh, Paul wrote a book. Um, it public, was published through the Foundry Press, which is the, uh, the in-house uh, publishing arm of the Nazarene Church. So he founded uh, Friendly Chapel Church of the Nazarene in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and he wrote an autobiography alongside uh, uh, an author named Kathy Tharp. And he, he just wrote his life story. And the name of the book is called Brother Paul. So Brother Paul was optioned um, by uh, our executive producer, Nick Logan, who lives in Virginia, and, and saw that there was really a good story here, a good true story that the world needed to hear about. So um, he commissioned a screenplay to be written. And then they, he reached out to uh, one of our other producers, um, Michael Davis, who lives in North Carolina, who has a company called Uptone Pictures. And he and I had partnered together on a couple of projects. And then Michael reached out to my company, Damascus Road Productions. And after we took a look at the book and read the script, we knew that this was a story that needed to see the light of day. So we we greenlit it very quickly in, in, the, in the world of Hollywood in the grand scheme of things. It, it, tends to take forever to get things off the ground. So we greenlit it really quickly and, uh, and and went into production within a few months. And it stars one of our dear friends, Nancy Stafford, who Isaac yes. and I have known for many years. So I love seeing her in it as well. Nancy is amazing. She is so good in this movie. And, you know, we were so blessed to get um, the, our first choice of cast. Everybody that we wanted to, to be in this movie, you know, in the on the production side, you sort of have a, a short list of people, your wish list of cast, and uh, Nancy was at the top of the list. The, in fact, we we created a character. It's a fictional character that, that was not a, was not uh, really uh, you know named um, Gertrude or Judy in the in Mama's real life, but it was an amalgam of several characters that we stuck together. And I'm telling you, Nancy knocked it out of the park. She was so great in this role. And she's won several Best Supporting Actress awards and film festivals all over the country for this. So she she tackled it with excellence and we were we were so glad to get her. I have seen that. In fact, Linda Pearl is another name from the past <laughs> yep. that I recognize. I'm like, yes. Linda Pearl, oh my gosh, I remember watching her when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Linda plays, plays my mother in this movie. And again, another one of those just real blessings where we, we had a person on the, the short list and we said, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if dot, dot, dot. And sure mm -hmm. enough, schedules freed up and it worked out. And and Linda is so good. Like Nancy, she's also won a ton of, of, of Best Actors awards uh, for this role. And she's so good in this. And fun fact, um, when you may know this already, but uh, when uh, Nancy was on, Nancy was on a, a, a series called Matlock, of course, yeah. a television series. And when she left the show, uh, she was replaced by, or, or another character slid in in place, not the same character, but Linda Pearl uh, was uh, in Nancy's place the next season of the show, and they reconnected for the first time in years on our movie. So they were both. I did not uh, know that. Wow, that's, I did not know that. that <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'm so glad you said that because we did not know that. Wow. That's yep. interesting. And of course, you also had Superman on this movie. Okay. So he's, not, we, he's we, not Superman, yeah. but he does play one on TV, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, Superman. I often say Dean Cain is the, is the closest thing to Superman that uh, that I that I've I've been around. Right. He's just such a such a, a humble guy, and and you know he's just a, an extraordinary talent. And uh, again, another one of those opportunities where we yeah. had another project with Dean, and and uh, I said, hey, it, wouldn't it be great if you would come alongside? And it was sort of a, a favor to the production where he comes in and and um, he plays my my boss, who's the fire chief in the movie. And again, as always with Dean Kane, you know he he flashes that mm -hmm. uh, that million dollar smile, and you you just fall in love with his character. So he's, he's the Christian amazing. Superman. He's a Christian he's a Superman. Superman. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Well, I'm yeah. I'm a. This movie is really, um, first of all, because it's set in the 60s, I think that there's a whole generation that have no idea mm -hmm. of what went on back then and what went on with kids and teenagers. And really some of the same thing is going on today. We hate to say it, but in a different way politically with racism and, and you know, putting people against each other and politically and in jobs and companies and stuff. So even though it's a, a, a true story from an, another time, it's very relevant for today, isn't it? 100%. Yeah. And, you know, we... we we were in the zeitgeist um, of uh, arguably of, of examining where we are as a country in, you know, in the fall of 2020. It was shortly after George Floyd. And we were, were really, as a nation, I believe, examining where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going as a country? And really forced all of us to examine um, our lives and, and uh, race relations specifically. 
Uh, and and this movie just happened to be. I think we're still we're still examining that today. And this movie happens to be, in my opinion, perfect timing for us to continue the conversation because it is a true story mm-hmm. about a real man who examined exactly that. And he was, yeah. you know, again by his own admission, uh, a, a racist guy who was who was malinformed and and not a great guy. And really, uh, because of the Bible, dived into what the Lord says about discrimination and specifically about racism and and really asked the big question, what does this mean to me? How does this affect and apply to my life? And what is the Lord calling me to do as a result? And, you know, Paul Holderfield would have been the first to say he didn't set out to start a church. He didn't set out to change the world. He didn't set out to change Little Rock. He really just examined his own life based on what the Bible plainly says and then adjusted accordingly. In fact, I just want to throw this in while you just said that. He started a church that was one of the first integrated church in the American South. That's right. That's, yeah. And that church big. is still still going strong today. And, you know, it was it was nearly unheard of, um, you know, to have have a, a, a black person and a white person or, you know, multi right. races preaching from the pulpit, certainly in the height of the civil rights era in the South in the 1960s. And Paul Holderfield was one of the guys that said it's not biblical for, uh, you know, for, for me to behave this way. And it was just such a, a fascinating story. We didn't have the time to creatively go into their reconnection, uh, you know, with the, mm-hmm. in this particular movie. But the true story is, you know, he was preaching, he was an itinerant preacher uh, around um, Little Rock and all around Arkansas. And he would often tell the story in his sermons. He would often tell the story about how he had denied his best friend. And he was preaching at a rural church, you know, uh, outside of Little Rock. And he told that story. And apparently these two little, two little old ladies came up to him afterwards and said, Hey, by the way, what was the name of that guy that you you denied and your your childhood best friend? And he said, "Oh, <laughs> that, I'm sure that he's long long gone by now, and he's he's probably long dead." But his name was Jimmy Lipkin, and the two women said, "Oh, well, if it's the same Jimmy Lipkin, he lives right around the corner." And and the name oh, of the area goodness. was Dixie Annex, oh, and they goodness. reconnected all those years later. And oh, Paul goodness. asked him for forgiveness, and so you see that scene at the end of the movie, which is a recreation of a real event where the two men shook hands mm-hmm. and uh, and Paul had the moniker Brother Paul and Jimmy apparently called him Brother Paul and forgave him for that and then uh, Paul oh. invited him to preach at his church regularly. Wow. wow. I love that you told that. Thank you. Because yes. that's yeah, the story after story. the story. And I love that, exactly. <laughs> well, that you long, added that. As long as we're into the story after the story, how about if you let us in, uh, just give us a little insight into you. Uh, who are you? How did, how did you get started in Christian filmmaking? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, you know, I've had uh, like like many other actors, producers. I've had kind of a, a weird roller coaster journey. Uh, I grew up in Virginia, didn't have any family or didn't know anybody in the business at all, and uh, and just felt like there um, there was some some modicum of of calling on my life to to do something in ministry. And I, I toyed honestly, I toyed with the idea of vocational ministry early on, and and had a very good mentor who spoke into my life and said, uh, the last thing the world needs is a half-hearted pastor. And so I, I loaded up my little red car and drove 3,000 miles. That was a, just over 25 years ago. And I, I landed on, mm-hmm. on this side of the country in, a, in a, the heart of Hollywood and, and tried to figure it out. So I, uh, like many other actors on the journey, I had a, you know, a small little agent that I was with and then a little bigger agent, a little bigger agent, and a little bigger manager. And then um, uh, just to, to make a long story longer, I, I went on tour from 2003 to 2013. I did large platform church events as a stand-up comedian and uh, uh, primarily at, you know, big, big uh, Christian uh, music festivals and things like that. And was a, a host of and a comedian on a bunch of tours all over the place. And then uh, finally, 10 years into that, uh, three three kids under five years old. My wife was ready to, to pull her hair out and mine. I realized I needed to come off the road. And then I, I dived back in front of the camera again and uh, landed a, a movie called Believe that Sony picked up. And that led yes. to a production company. And again, a, lo- a long, long-winded story. But now we, um, we're in the faith and family marketplace and seek to, through my company, uh, put films out into the world that have an, an element of truth in them. I was going to ask you about that because I, I read, as I was reading up on you, I read that you were a comedian. And, you know, what I saw in the movie, of course, is nothing funny yes. at all. Uh, and I'm oh, like, my wife is the first really? to say that. She's like, the last few movies you've done, no one would ever know that. So, no <laughs> ever know. Or not, but. I know. But I also read that you are a number one best selling author. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, Tell us about uh, that. 
thankful to a, again such a weird uh, career track but a few years ago i accidentally was part of a viral video company and that really spawned out of a, of a bible study that met in you know in my backyard and a bunch of guys that would meet regularly in, in my backyard and we we were kind of in the height of frozen if you remember disney's frozen <clears throat> and so i found right. myself as a as a 40 something year old guy who knew every line to a Disney musical, you know, <laughs> singing it out loud in the shower. And so uh, one of us at some point said, and I think this is how all great ideas get started. One of us said, you know what would be funny, dot, dot, dot. And it was, uh, we decided to shoot a, uh, a funny viral video. The plan was never to go viral. I don't think there's any recipe necessarily. You can't, you can't predict viral, you can't make viral, it just happens. But again, we were in the height of Frozen, and we rewrote one of the songs to Disney's Frozen, and viral happened, and we had millions of hits, and that spawned into an opportunity to write a book, which was based on my stand-up. So my first book was called Parenting Rules, colon, The Hilarious Handbook for Surviving Parenthood. So it was a number oh, one, number one bestseller that. on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and and still is on Amazon, so people can still read it and still do it. That's so true. you are also in Starship Troopers. I'm laughing because I love that movie, actually. <laughs> it's a yeah, good song, it's a, my classic. It's a cult classic, actually. <laughs> it really is, and I, I have to look behind. I did have it on the wall behind me. I think they moved it to another part of the office. But, uh, yeah, the, that was one of my first movies. I did, uh, I did That Thing You Do with Tom Hanks and... Uh, Starship Troop Troopers right around the same time and back-to-back uh, -back movies and none of us at the time knew knew what we had on our hands for sure and I know the cast of both the crew and cast of both those movies would tell you the same thing but for Starship Troopers obviously it's become a cult uh, you know a cult hit and I'm I'm still in contact with uh, with Casper and and Patrick and Denise still to this day and you know it's just we're all sort of amazed that it's caught fire we I run into people all over the place that know and love that movie. And still, it is a cult classic. I wasn't kidding. It really is. People love that movie. And Casper is a Christian, and and I haven't seen him much lately. But he was he's beloved. He's done some great pieces before. Hoping to see. Yeah, him great guy. He just did a great turn. Uh, he was in a, a western film that a, that a friend of mine was part of, and he just did a, a great role. You know, he's got that just perfect, <sighs> rugged, you know, chiseled look, and you know, he'd probably blush if he were sitting next to me right now. But he's just perfect for those kind of hero roles. And uh, but he's still he's still doing great. Well, I want to ask you real quickly about your development company and what your production company, I should say, and what are some of the future projects we can look forward to seeing, you know, in the next few months or years that you're working on? Yeah, we have several right around the right around the corner here. I'm really excited about one that's uh, that's coming out. I'll be I'll be judicious because of <laughs> because of NDAs and contracts and things like that. But but I'll, I'll give you I'll just tease it by saying it's a story of of um, the first black millionaire in this country. Uh, who was an 11 year old little girl and so we're, we're very excited about that story and uh, i think it's just gonna you know it, it's gonna do it's gonna do very well and, a, and again another one of those um stories that's a true story that that is kind of lost to history and most of us don't know about so i'm excited about that one um we have another one about a uh, a rural pastor and a uh, a pastor of a of a mega church in the city they grew up uh, brothers that were kind of at odds with each other and, uh, and, and one, one pastor's a big church, one pastor's a small church, and they're, they're still uh, kind of at odds at who's, who's really doing, who's doing kingdom work. I have another movie that's actually coming out in theaters this, uh, this Christmas. Uh, in fact, I think it opens December 2nd, an amazing, I say amazing because I'm biased, a very funny movie, I should say, called Bringing Back Christmas. Uh, that's sort of an homage to, um, uh, you know, to Christmas classics, uh, like It's a Wonderful Life, where a character goes back in time and he happens to be present when Mary and Joseph are getting ready to have the baby. And so you realize people have had it bad for 2000 years and it's going to be OK. Suck it up. So yeah, a Christmas comedy, bringing back Christmas. And is that going to be released in theaters? Yeah. Yeah. We'll be in release uh, select theaters around the country first week of December. And then we're all into streaming and DVD right after. Now, that's the movie that was shot at Capernaum Studios, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Holly, very good. Very good research. Your stomping grounds. I remember when you guys were working on it, as a matter of fact, because I met the other producers, Ariel and her husband. And, and yep. um, I remember pulling up one day, and I don't know if you were there, but there were several that were there, including Ariel. And I forgot her husband's name. What's her husband's Trey. name? Trey. Trey. Thank mine. you. Yep. Thank you. And they were praying in front of the ticket office. They were praying before they walked down on the set. Hmm. And I just thought that was so touching. I took a you know little video of it. And when you guys are going to do your movie, when it's going to come out, I'm going to show some stuff on social media to say when they were at Capernaum, this was a praying crew. It was really impressive. 
you know, and there's three well, people. Well, thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. That, it was such a, it was such a great crew. And it's the first time I had filmed in Texas and it was such a great crew and, and just an excellent crew base and people to, you know, to pull from. And, and, uh, several of those days, you remember it was this, this past summer and you guys know, know just as well, but you know, we were at triple digit heat and, uh, and several of the days we had, you know, upwards of 75 extras that were on set and uh, <laughs> you know, 100, 110, 115 degrees. And yeah. I often say those Texans are, are hardy stock because they, you know, not only did nobody keel over, they asked if they could come back the next day. So it was, can it. I can testify. It was hot out there. <laughs> if you're wearing a we're costume in, too, you know? Yeah, exactly. We're in that, you know, that first century period attire and it's just heavy and the wool and the, you know, the, the head pieces and it was just miserable, but, uh, we survived. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That was, well, we're looking forward to that. And again, that's bringing back Christmas and that'll be in December. So that's going to come. Okay. You mentioned something and I know we're running out of time, short time, but the first black millionaire was a girl. I thought it was a black woman who did cosmetics. That was the first that was a little bit later, but the first was a was a, a, a black little girl uh, named Sarah Rector in Oklahoma. Wow. She was 11 years old, and uh, they struck oil on her property. So uh-huh. they, they were given a, a plot of land. You know, if you could prove that you could read or write, read and write, and were a descendant of a slave, you got a plot of land that was often barren, and, and oh, wow. you know, there was nothing they could do with it anyway. But they struck oil on her property, and she. I'm giving the whole story away, but she ended up, uh, <laughs> you know getting her, her whole community out of poverty and giving away most of her money to the church and starting an orphanage and a huge, oh. huge philanthropist. Yeah. Okay, but I'm glad you just said that because I want to see that movie. Yes. I want to see yes. that movie. What, That's an exciting story. When do you guys wow. plan to go in production on that? Uh, tentatively in January of 23, January oh, nice, of next year. Nice, nice. Well, we may well, then have are- to have you back. I, I was going to say, we're going to be talking to you every six yeah. months. You're a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. And I'll come on anytime. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I we thank you for, to, yeah, go ahead. Do we have, do we have time, Isaac? Yeah, do we sure, have another go ahead, minute? Go ahead. Just a quick question. Doing the movie, it had a lot of scenes, different kind. What was your favorite scene? What was one that you walked away with going, boy, I love that scene. And that really touched you. Yeah. Although it was a hard one, probably my favorite one, which is, is in the trailer is the scene where, um, where Paul loses it with his wife and he's just at the boiling point and he's in the kitchen and just everything is, you know, everything has come to a head. He's wrestling with his own thoughts about racism. He's wrestling with his best friends at the firehouse who would lay down their lives for him, but they don't believe the things that he do that does. And so he's just at a boiling point and he, he throws a, you know, a, a wine bottle against the wall and he just has this moment of just breaking down and then he sees his, his children and, and has to snap out of it. So just as an actor, that emotional journey was, was difficult, but, um, but I think it worked well in the final product. So if people, want to know, like if, if people want to know where uh, the movie's going to be showing, is there a website they can go to? Yes, sir. You can go to paulspromisemovie.com. Everything right. is there, including a, a tab for theaters. And they can click on that and find out where the theater is playing closest to them. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate your taking time. I know thank that you're you. about to take off and go into all sorts of premieres all over the country. Uh, but we thank you for taking the time to be, to be with us today. Truly my pleasure. I'd love to come back anytime. Well, Holly, we've we'll run out of time. It. We have we completely run out of time. Run out of time. Go, oh, so I, I, don't, I, I don't even we have to tell people to write us. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we'll see write you again us. next week. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Write us. We'll see you again next week, though, okay? <laughs> <laughs>